Hello, and welcome to my legislative report. I'm State Representative Julie Harhart of the 183rd District in Lehigh and Northampton Counties. On this month's report, I want to share part two of a recent presentation to Northampton High School students to make them more aware of problems such as cyberbullying, distractive driving, and driving while under the influence of alcohol or drugs. This event, which I hosted, featured guest speakers who talked to the students about ways to recognize and avoid these modern day threats to their well-being. I hope you find this program informative. The next topic, of course, is a, a real um, serious topic also, and that is uh, texting or emailing or talking on your cell phone while, while driving. That's called distractive driving. Um, we have um, a real current concern today um, with this occurring with uh, phones and emails and texting uh, while driving. This could, uh, this, as I said, is called uh, distractive driving and it is the cause of growing number of vehicle accidents and deaths each year. Um, it is illegal to text or email someone while driving a vehicle in Pennsylvania. So if you see someone doing this while you are in the car with them, remind them of the law and the dangers of this kind of distraction um, when on the road. Of course, I know none of you really do that, right? No, no, right? No, you can shake your head. No, no, okay. Um, another dangerous thing uh, some drivers do is, is also drink and drive, and alcohol slows your um, reflexes down. And um, so that's, that's uh, uh, another really um, issue that we want to discuss here today. Um, you have to remember that driving is a, is a privilege. It's not a right. It is a privilege. So with that, we're going to have uh, Mr. Uh, Kim Davis talk to us a little bit about the dangers of drinking and driving and share a personal story um, that he has had with health and physical education. He's the health and physical education teacher, which I'm sure you all know. Uh, and that's Mr. Davis. And I will turn it over to you. Most of my students already know um, my parents were killed by a drunk driver. My sister is here. She got the phone call before I did. So when we, when we talk about things that can happen, um, <clears throat> regardless of how well you get along with your family, losing them at one shot is pretty tough. Um, we did get the phone call. Uh, you know, can you come and identify the bodies? You do not want your, your parents, your friends, your relatives, where you have to make them get that phone call. Okay, it was a, they, they were actually celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary at a real fancy restaurant that you all might know. It's called Doughboy's Pizza in Moore Township. Okay, because they were not very wealthy as, as we knew. Um, but the lady that hit them was 0.28 blood alcohol level and she had three illegal narcotics in her system she was also killed. The thing that also happened in that accident, and very luckily, when they put the car, her, the, the other driver's car, on the rollback to be taken to the junkyard, the person putting the car on the rollback heard a little bit of a groan. And what happened was, in the other lady's car, her six-year-old nephew was in the back seat. And upon impact, he flew up off the ceiling of the car and landed down in the front passenger wheel well. And she had a smaller car, and the wheel well was rolled up over the seat, so he was hidden. And very luckily, he groaned, and that's the only way they knew he was in there. He was also permanently bra brain damaged, and we haven't heard a whole lot about what happened to them. The, the other family did not maintain any contact with us, but... Um, on the personal side, uh, it's, a pretty it's pretty much of a shock. And it's pretty much of a tough process to go through. You know, you, we, we've had some incidents in the past where some of you have had personal cases of family members, losing family members. You know, and when it happens, it's still a shock. So... Um, yeah, it, it, 
0.28 is pretty high. <laughs> and uh, so that's kind of like where I came from on that. And again, with the distracted driving that we're looking at right now, hopefully when we get to the questions a little bit later, we'll answer some of the questions that you guys wrote down and uh, we'll try to get those points across for you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Cyberbullying is using electronic communications such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram to make uh, disparaging comments about another person such as their sexuality or sexual activity, physical characteristics and or mental health or anything that is intended to do or and would cause serious emotional distress to a person. It is also considered harassment if the person would use such communication to make these threats and um, inflict harm. You know, unfortunately, this type of bullying is becoming way too prevalent, and I'm sure you are aware, or perhaps have, which I hope not, have been or um, even been a victim of this type of bullying. To address the problem, the Pennsylvania House of Representatives recently passed legislation, which was House Bill 229, to make cyber harassment of a youth a criminally punishable offense. The legislation uh, would allow law enforcement and juvenile probation officers to review the case it involves in a person under the age of 18. If appropriate, a juvenile offender could be placed in a a uh, diversionary program rather than formally adjudicated as a delinquent. And an adult who engages in such conduct would be prosecuted in court rather than be issued a summary citation, reflecting the seriousness of the form of child abuse. This legislation is now before the Senate. So here today, I just announced Terry, and she is going to be going over um, the bullying and the uh, texting and driving. And Sherry is uh, with the, um, she's the director of the chronic disease programs with the City of Bethlehem Bureau of Health. Sherry, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Representative Harhart. We're going to start with distracted driving. We've done, I've been doing distracted driving education probably since 1999. Um, we have been really working hard across the Lehigh Valley to get the message across to youths that our vehicles are actually made with room to live. If, um, if you look at your vehicle in the driver's seat, the passenger seat, and the back seat, um, it's reinforced basically the, those areas when you're in position and you have your seatbelt on your hands are at 10 and 2 and you're sitting nice and straight your airbag is made to help you live and your seatbelt is made to help you live and survive any type of crash what what happens is we don't stay in position when we drive we're basically being distracted alive by of course the texting and driving but you're being distracted every time you change the cd player the, the radio station if you have a dog on your lap or in the back seat of your car <clears throat> while you're you have your ipod and you're looking for a song on your ipod you have your earbuds in which are illegal by the way if you're driving you can't have both earbuds in your ears at the same time um, while you're driving um, when you're talking on the phone whether it's a hand held device or hands-free device um, AAA actually did some studies that when you are on a hands-free cell phone device, you end up talking on the phone longer than you do on a handheld device, even though you're, you tend to be more distracted because you only have one hand when you're holding the cell phone. Um, when you're talking on the phone, you become distracted because you're engaged in that conversation. So what we're trying to, to get the message across to teens is that your car your vehicle has room to live if you have all the safety measures in place. So you have your seatbelt on, your airbags in front of you, and if you have your hands at 10 and 2 and you're paying attention to doing to driving, which you should be doing when you're in a 6,000 pound vehicle, um, you should be able to not have any crashes and, and actually drive safely on the roadways. So just think of oh, the other two things that uh, are very common with distracted driving is eating in your car while driving. And how many of you drive in this room? How many of you already drive? Just one. Um, so you want to make that a policy. Um, I'm actually a registered dietitian, so from my standpoint, from nutrition, um, we like to not have people eat in your car because when you're distracted, you just tend to eat whatever and, and eat a lot. So you shouldn't be eating in your car anyway. And you know, we also see people put makeup on the car. So just you know, make sure you get up a little bit earlier, put your makeup on at home, and you know, pay attention to driving. 
The other thing that I do is um, I sit on the Northampton County Child Death Review Team. And I, I'm the co-chair of it. I've been on it since 1999 when we first started it. And what we do is we review every child death 21 years of age and younger. And we determine preventability of the death. So we review all, all the deaths, uh, whether they're crashes, whether it's suicide, whether it's you know, you know, a baby being born that didn't survive. Um, and when I went back and looked at all this, the statistics from all of the teens who have either died or been in crashes since we've been, we've been reviewing the deaths, we have determined that it's speed and loss of control of the vehicle that is causing our crashes and our fatalities among our, our youth. What we don't have a good handle on is whether or not that, dis that teen has been distracted. It's very difficult to determine what you were doing at the time of the crash. Um, our coroners are very good. A lot of times they will go back, they'll pull the phone, they'll pull the phone records, and they will try and determine what was going on at that time of crash to determine whether or not you were distracted. Something we as a team are really trying to get a better handle on. Um, you know, because we have all the national and st uh, statistics that are out there that say, you know, teens are very distracted when driving. We just don't have any hardcore evidence here in Northampton County um, with our review team. So we are, we are making that part of the process as well. But, you know, when we're talking about speeding or loss of control of vehicle, it absolutely could be because you're distracted while driving. So message, you know, being that I know you've probably all have heard this message many, many times. But you know the over the overarching message is when you're in your vehicle, make sure that you are paying attention to what you're doing and that's driving. Um, and that's all I guess I have to say about that. Mm -hmm. You want to go into cyberbullying? Cyber cyberbullying is an issue that's near and dear to my heart. Um, again, like I said, with the Northampton Child death review team, we are finding more and more suicides in Northampton County. And we actually have a very high rate of suicides in Northampton County among our teens. So when we started to take a look, um, drill down deeper into why teens are, are dying by suicide, it's, you were, we're becoming more and more because they're being bullied. They're being bullied on their, their social media. So one, one of the reasons is because it's called hyper-networking. We have teens who never disconnect from social media. You are on social media all the time. You never disconnect. You're con it's constantly in your face. So if a teen is being bullied, you are never disconnecting from that. So it seems like it's a lot worse than what it is. I am actually a past graduate of Northampton High School back in 1989. We didn't have cell phones. So if we were being bullied, you know, it was like maybe during the school day, you went home, you disconnected, and it didn't happen in the evening. So it was, you know, if you came back to school the next day, it really wasn't so bad. You know, now you have your cell phones with you all day, all night, um, or whatever m media device you're using. So it's really important that you try and take a break from your social media device. But um, we know that 80% of teens are using a cell phone regularly, which is the most common medium for cyberbullying. We know that 25% of teens are being bullied through text messaging. We know that 64% of teens are being bullied online through Facebook. We know that 29% of teens are being bullied through Twitter. And we know that 21% of kids have received means of threatening emails or other types of, of direct messages. And the scary part is only one in 10 of you who, who may be bu being bullied inform a parent of the abuse. And the even uh, more scary statistic is about only one in six parents actually know that their child has been bullied or is being bullied. Um, we also know that cyberbullying um, victims are more likely to use a method of, of suicide to end the task uh, instead of telling somebody. So there is this campaign that's out there, it's called Be a Hero, and it's something that you should all consider that if you see somebody being bullied or know somebody that's being bullied, maybe just an extend a, you know, hey, how are you doing? Is there anything I can do to help? Um, because that really goes a long way to make them feel like they're, that they're, they have no other um, they have no other avenue but to, to commit suicide. So we are trying to, to promote that campaign and just be nice to one another. There 
was a school, um, there was a principal in a school, it was a private school up in New Hampshire, and he t- really took bullying to a great level where he, he expelled any student in the school who bullied or any student who was watching somebody being bullied. So if somebody had, if somebody was being bullied and, and he, they reported the crime or, um, or somebody else reported it to the principal, he pulled all the videotapes in the school and he called every student in who watched that occur and they all got in trouble. And he really significantly reduced bullying in his school. So I, I wish all schools would do that because it really takes the bully and getting the bully in trouble instead of uh, all of us doing the education to the person who's being bullied to say, just deal with it or don't do this or don't do that, stay away from it. It's hard for them to do that. Um, so th- I know that that school has set some good precedent and I would like to see um, everybody try and, and do that here as well, um, that the bully is actually the person who gets in trouble and is forced to change their behavior versus the victim. But same, some things that, that you should, do, should not do when you're, uh, or should do when you're being bullied, um, well, first of all, you shouldn't share any of your information you know, on your networking sites, which I think everybody probably knows, um, but may or may not do. But if you are being cyberbullied, don't respond. And that, I know that's a really hard thing to do, especially at your age, you're, you're impulsive, and you wanna just send a really you know, mean text message right back to that person. But the better thing to do is to take a screenshot of what, was, of what message was sent to you or what picture was sent to you and not respond and then block them from whatever media you're using. You can block them from Facebook, you can block them from Instagram, you can block them from Twitter. Um, so just take, that, take as many screenshots as you need to and then report it. You can report it to your school, report it to your parents, let them know what's going on so they can do something about it. Um, what else can you do? Keep a record um, of, of if you block them and they move on to a different Next device. Class is fourth period class. Please report to room 1322. Mr. Thrash, fourth period class. Please report to room 1322. Thank you. The one, you know, what I always say as a parent and as an educator is be smart about it. If, you, if you're being bullied and you, or you don't like something that came across your social media, block it, take a, a picture of it, and let somebody else know so they can help you handle the situation. Because if you go back and, and you respond back to that person or you do something right back, that lessens the leverage that either your parent or the school has because then you've just engaged in that activity as well. The school does have a responsibility um, to, to address situations that are, are happening during the school day. So you always can use your school as an avenue to report any type of bullying activity, whether it's cyberbullying or um, physical bullying. Um, and then I think the, the rest of the, the information that I had are gonna be answered in the questions that are going to be asked. Okay, thank you. Thank you both for um, <clears throat> the information, and I hope that uh, the thing you could take away from um, the uh, human trafficking is to please be careful with that. If you see it, any suspicious uh, or any kind of uh, suspicion about that, to be sure to report it to law enforcement officers. Um, I will leave the phone numbers with your teachers, and you know she could distribute those. And as far as uh, the Uh, texting and driving most important thing is to take away from that is you keep your hands on the wheel do not take those hands off that wheel or your eyes off the road and for cyberbullying just don't react to them just you know kind of walk away if you can and uh, don't if it's on your as said if it's on your um, phone or computer turn it off don't even respond to it so we are going to have uh, questions and, and answers here, and uh, we're going to have a panel of teachers that are going to ask the questions. We have Kim Davis, uh, Northampton Phys Ed health teacher. He's going to be asking about uh, uh, distracted driving questions, and Sally Madden, Northampton High School librarian, asking about cyberbullying questions. So, uh, Mr. Davis? 
Yeah, I have some questions here that were um, <clears throat> given to me by the students in my class. Is there anything coming down the line, or will there be, or is it probably going to be left up to individual schools, as I think you kind of stated, to bring back some kind of safety education, driver education class before these kids get their license? Is that directed to me? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, to my knowledge, no. Okay. I, I, as I said, I don't sit on education, but I certainly could find out that could be talked about, being talked about. There could even be legislation out there. So uh, what we can do is I could do that research and mm -hmm. I get back to it with a definite answer. But I'm pretty sure from, it's no. From your viewpoint or from what you've been talking about in Harrisburg, is the state considering adding stiffer fines and penalties for distracted driving? We have. We, we have done legislation to do exactly that, yes. Do you in think fact, it's going to get worse? There, uh, do you mean the, the penalties the pen are going to get more severe? I, well, there's legislation out there now doing exactly that. Okay. Do you think that when, we, when the people are being tested for their driver's license, that it should be more of a realistic driving situation rather than the closed course situation that we kind of have now? You know, I haven't taken a driver's test. I don't know. What do they do now? <laughs> I, I, I think it so varies. Long. I think it varies depending sure. on facility. They, they what? I think it varies depending on where you go. Like some places have a closed course. Mm -hmm. Some places take you out on the highway. Some places actually take you out on like 22 or 80. Um, it, I think the, the, the question was kind of, is there going to be like any standardized testing for the driving uh, license rather than having it left up to individual facilities? To my knowledge, no. There's okay. nothing being worked on in okay. Harrisburg. But that's something I, well, you know, we have like 22 committees. Mm -hmm. and that would probably come out of, um, I would say, uh, transportation, which I do sit on now. So um, that might be something to bring Well, back. and your answers kind of reflect the fact that it's not just easily done. No, no. It's, it's not. not just easily done. No, it um, takes a, a while. Do you know, are there any situations where adults have to retake the test? Is there a minimum age or? Well, I, it's, um, I know there's a 55 and older group. I think ARP retests um, their seniors. Um, and there is no, uh, no mandate to, tell, to um, have anybody at any age retake the test unless he has a health problem and his license is taken away from him or um, you know something may mm -hmm. have happened that his license may have uh, a person's license may have ta taken away from him then they do have to be retested is there any chance of less testing being required for kids before they take their test no. and that's a good thing <laughs> no. and that's a good thing and that's Anything, a good thing it'll be a little bit even more strong well that's what we worked yeah. on in 1999 yes <laughs> And it's been um, working. Yeah, it is. It's, it's been, been. Do you think there will be any retraining situations after a student gets their license where every several years or every so often they'd have to retake the test? No. Okay. No. And Not the, at this point anyway. Okay. And the last question that I have is um, statistically, maybe she can help out a little bit there, uh, percentage of fatalities caused by distracted driving? I have 20% uh, of injury crashes are distracted driving and 16% of those are less than 20 years of age. Okay, thank you. And again, I'd like to thank Representative Harhart, Mr. Morganelli, Bethlehem Health Bureau for coming today. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll have uh, Ms. Madden, Sally Madden. Yes, okay. The first question, how can you protect someone from cyberbullying and still guarantee First Amendment rights? That's definitely a history class question. <laughs> <laughs> yes. If I'm understanding that question, I, I debated this question um, a lot, that you can agree to disagree with somebody or you can still um, voice your opinion. You just need to be ethical in doing so. You can't, 
you know, defame somebody's character or be physically, mentally, or, or emotionally abusive to somebody when you're talking to them. So I guess, you know, my answer to that is just being mindful of how you word things and, and ethical in your responses. Okay. Uh, the second question, with ever-changing technology and new websites being constantly created, can the government safeguard the youth from cyberbullying online? Again, that's a difficult um, question to answer. Um, it's, you know, the, the websites uh, are vehicles. It's, they can't control the person who's using it. So being self-responsible um, is, is the way to go. If you're responsible and using that website or, you know, what you put, you're putting the, the information on that website, then everything should be okay. Uh, the third question, should there be a law that holds the websites accountable for bullying that takes place on their site? Again, uh, with the laws, again, it's hard because then somebody has to enforce the law with the website. And, and they do have terms of services. Um, I know I pulled the one from Facebook that everybody agrees to when you go on the website or you uh, sign up for any type of new account, you hit that I agree button because if you can't, if you don't hit that I agree button, you can't set up that new account. So most of us just go through and click, 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 and you don't read what is the terms that, that are set forth behind that agree button. And there is, you know, especially on Facebook, there is a safety factor there and it lists the terms that say you will not bully, intimidate, or harass the user. You will not post content that is hate speech, threatening, pornographic, incites violence, contains nudity or graphic or violence. Uh, you will not develop or operate a third-party um, application containing alcohol-related dating or mature content. You will not use Facebook to do anything unlawful or misleading, malicious, or discriminatory. Um, and then there's another part of it that says protecting other people's rights. Well, you will not post um, anything on Facebook that infringes or violates someone else's rights or, or violates the law. So they have those provisions in place already. I think we just don't know about them because we don't read them. Okay. And I think that you've answered the last question. Should some entity own the internet so it can better be, be better policed? You've alluded to that. With self-responsibility. Yeah, I think if everybody is self-responsible when using the social media, um, we wouldn't have to worry about that. Um, but again, you know, I think all of the social media outlets have terms in place that you agree to when you're using it. So just abiding by those rules and policies that they put out. That's all the questions that the students had. Thank you very much for the information. I want to thank uh, your teacher, Mrs. Stoltz, um, and I really mean that. She has a very passion, a, a passion about this, and uh, it shows, and she's very concerned about you. And I um, just really want to thank her for helping put this together and all of today's presenters, and I think we were able to share a lot of important information um, here today. I also want to thank all the students for participating and, um, and for asking really great questions. And um, I hope you will take what you have learned here today and share it with your parents and with your friends and, um, so that we can all be a little bit more safer. That's all the time we have for today's program. If you would like to know more about what you have just seen, or if I can help you with any state government re related matters, please contact me at my district office or through my website or Facebook. The information will be on your screen in a moment. Thanks for watching and please join me next time for Legislative Report.